Dusty. He's uh, Floyd and Frankie's grandson, but they raised him, so it's just like their son. And uh, so really be praying for that family. Uh, it's a big family, and uh, I, I know God has a reason for this. And it's my hope and my prayer that uh, people will get saved as a result of this. Be praying at, at the, for the funeral and for the sermon that I'll be delivering at the funeral. Because, you see, Dusty is gone. There's nothing we can do for Dusty. But maybe we can reach some of those that are left. And I know that that would be what Dusty would want. It's really good to have Raymond and Vera with us this morning. I told Raymond, I said, them old sailors, boy, they're tough. I said, the ship might go down, but they just bob right back to the surface like a fishing cork. And uh, Raymond just amazes me at how, how well he does on something like this. And uh, I'm just really glad to have him. Turn, if you will, to the fifth chapter of St. Luke, the fifth chapter of St. Luke. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Now this in the Greek actually means the net was at the point of breaking. And they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. On a certain sea coast, there was a little hut, and there were some voluntary men that had a couple of rowboats, and ships would pass that way, and there would be frequent shipwrecks, and these men were dedicated to row out day or night and rescue uh, the survivors and bring them in to the shore. And this place became very famous. And some of the people that had been rescued, plus others, had donated, began to donate money, and they began to volunteer to uh, row the, the boats, and they bought new boats, and and the, since it was such a small hut, they decided they needed a better building, and so they built a better building, and, and, and it, it, it just grew and grew, and they had more and more members and more and more people volunteering, and they just kept enlarging the place and remodeling the place, and, and it just kind of like turned into be a country club. One night there was a shipwreck, and they brought in all these people, and they were bleeding, and they were uh, sick and, and dirty and everything that they'd fished out of the water, and so the building committee got together and said, look, this won't do. We can't bring these people in here uh, because of our nice facilities, and they're just messing the place up. And so they very quickly built showers so that the people, they could bring them and they could take a shower before they brought them in. 
And then finally, well, it got to the point where they said, you know, really, this is just kind of messing up everything. said, I think we need to dispense with this, uh, with the rescue efforts. But some of them said, no, wait a minute, that's what we are. We're a life-saving station. And so they were outvoted, and the others said, well, if you want to do that, then you go down the shore ways and you build you another life-saving station, which they did. But in time, that one went the same way as the first one went. It turned into a country club. But there were a few said, no, we're to be a life-saving station. So they said, well, you go build you one, and they did. And, and one after one, history kept repeating itself, and they kept building these country clubs. And today, you can go down that shore, and you see country club after country club. Boats are still wrecking, and people are still drowning. And folks, that's what happened to the church. The church has turned into a country club. It's turned into a place where we just come and meet and fellowship. But the church as we know it today is no longer a life-saving station. And the sob of God's heart is evangelism. God's purpose for the church is that it's a life-saving station. I don't believe it was ever in the heart of God to build great cathedrals. The church is the people. We've lost our way. We've lost our mission. We think the end result is just to come Sunday and meet. And people are perishing all around us. Now, God's heart for the lost didn't begin with the birth of Christ. In the, be in the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, he said, I'll send a redeemer that will crush the serpent's head. When God formed the nation of Israel, he said, you shall be a nation of priests unto me. It was God's intention to have a holy nation that would witness to a lost, dying world and bring them unto them, him, to himself. And we find Moses such a burden on his heart for his people. And he said, Oh God, if thou wilt forgive their sins, but if not, then block my name out of the book thou hast written. Boy, that's a burden, isn't it? He had his priorities straight. He had a burden for the lost. He had a burden for his people who were lost. All down through time, there have been the few that have had their priorities straight. Had a burden for the lost. Folks, there's people outside the doors of this church that are perishing. They're perishing without Christ and without hope while we play church. And all the while they're saying, no man cares for my soul. What a tragedy. God says, I have put this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure is he talking about? The gospel. Folks, you are an earthen vessel. God has put that treasure inside you. And what happens? We hide it. And the Bible says if the gospel be hid, it's hid to those that are lost. What a shame. What a pity. People are going to hell. I don't care. I'm going to do my own thing. 
I'm going to live the way I want to live. I don't care whether it's right. I don't care whether it's wrong. I'm going to do what I want to do and let the world be damned. That's our attitude. God hates sin. Paul said, I tell you, even we be, there are those that are enemies of the cross. If you're not going to live for God, at least get out of the way. Makes me sick in my stomach. It's horrible. But I'll tell you what, God will take it up with your judgment. What's wrong with us? We just don't care. Man, I don't know. Jesus just preached a sermon, told Peter to launch out into the deep and let down his net. Peter begins to argue. Lord, it won't do any good. I fished all night long. Listen, folks, this was not a hobby with him. He was a professional fisherman. That's the way he made his living. He says, I know what I'm doing. And I've fished all night long and have caught nothing. What do we do? Same thing. Oh, Lord, I know. Yeah, I know what you say. I, I know what you say. I know we're supposed to be out there witnessing and sharing the gospel. But see, Lord, now look. Now look, we're professionals at this. I mean, now here's the way we do it. But Peter said, nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the nets. You know what he was saying? I'll do it your way, Lord. I'll do it your way. Do you know that's all God's asking us to do? Just do it my way. One time I preached a revival in a broken arrow at a big church. And that week they had what's called Pack-a-Pew night. They had a contest. And the way it works, like, well, like Wayne, you'd be responsible for packing your pew, and, and it was like a contest, you know. That turned out to be a joke. Well, at the end of the revival, the last night of the revival, I said, I'll tell you something, folks, it didn't work, did it? Because that's not God's way. What is God's way? God's way is to dedicate, dedicate yourself to God, get sin out of your life, let him put a burden in your heart, then go out and share the gospel. Not have pie suppers. Pack a pew. You can go to the feed store and bring in sacks of feed and we can pack the pews. You know, a guy came to me one time and he wanted me to come to his church. He was having a revival. He said, Jerry, would you come to my revival? I was really touched. But here's a man that cares. He wants me to come to his revival. Then he went on to say, we're having pack a pew night and I need some people to pack my... Is that all I am? You just want me to take up space? It's not God's way. It's not God's way of doing it. But Peter said, Lord, we'll do it your way. We've tried and we're professionals and we know what we're doing. But nevertheless, at thy word, we'll do it your way. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And look what happened. They needed help. They caught so many people. There's so many fish. They couldn't even bring them in the boat. They needed help. Wouldn't that be something if we did it God's way and it found out we needed help? There's so many people coming to Christ. We need to call other churches and say, come help us. 
The net's breaking. Come help us. Come help us. We need teachers. We need Christian workers because the net's breaking. We tried it God's way. And so James and John goes on to say, and they beckoned with their partners and to their partners which were in the other ship and they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Woo! Man, wouldn't that be something when so many people getting saved that the building committee had to get together and said, hey guys, we're going to have to shore up these floors or we're all going to wind up in the basement. The building's settling. The, the, the foundation's settling. You know why Jesus did that? You think he cared for the fish? It wasn't that Jesus wanted fish. He's trying to prove a point. And the point is, if you do it my way, there's guaranteed success. And do you know what else he's saying? You get more fish than you ever could imagine. You'll be successful beyond your wildest dreams. Now, now, now look what he asked him to do. I mean, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of brains. Just drop the net. But folks, you've got to drop it in the right place under the direction of the Holy God. You know what Jesus said? Ye can do nothing without me. And did you know that James and John and Peter, they proved that? They fished all night, didn't catch anything. Jesus, I'm the vine, you the branches. The man abides in me. He'll bear fruit. It's just so automatic. There's no strain. There's no stress. If you have an apple tree in your yard, isn't it amazing in the spring, buds come on the limbs. I mean, you don't hear that tree out there just groaning and straining. And hear the buds just... Popping out, uh -uh. it's silent. Then an apple begins to form and it grows <coughs> into fruit. You know what? I really believe this. So when it isn't hard, if the Lord's in it, if we do it His way. Now look what He goes on to say. When Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O oh God, O oh Lord. You see, he realized he was in the presence of God himself because he'd fished all night, didn't catch anything. He'd probably drop that net all over that lake, didn't catch anything. One time and the nets are full and the ships are sinking. Falls on his knees. Said, oh, I'm a sinful man. Folks, that's humility. And that's one thing I really believe is lacking today is humility. You know what's wrong is we're puffed up. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do what I want to do. And nobody's going to tell me different. But he fell before holy God said depart from me that reminds me of the unseen captain in Joshua he said you take off your shoes you're on holy ground Moses saw the burning bush and God the same God that directed Peter to drop the net said Moses you're on holy ground take your shoes off and that's what Peter ex experienced oh depart from me old Lord I'm a sinful man. Look at this. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. They were astonished. 
Do you know the early church, the Jerusalem church, they didn't know any better, and so they was doing it God's way. And I mean, people were being saved like you wouldn't believe. I want to turn to this real quick and read this. There on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached. <laughs> Guess what happened? 3,000 souls were saved. You know why they were saved? Because Peter learned how to fish from the best. Because, see, Jesus said this, follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men. You know why we're not catching fish? We're not following him. That's automatic. Follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Here was a church that's following him. I want to begin here with the second chapter in the 41st, 42nd verse. Now, now notice something. First of all, what happened? And they continued steadfast. They got saved. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. What are they doing? They continued steadfastly, what? In the apostles' doctrine, the truth. The truth that the Bible teaches. They were steadfast in that. Folks, listen, I want to tell you something. First of all, we want to need to find out what is truth and then stick with it. Don't be blown about by every wind of doctrine. If someone isn't preaching the truth and you know they're not preaching the truth, why are you supporting them? Why are you helping them? You know what it says in John? It says if these people come to you and you wish them Godspeed, you become partakers of their evil deeds. It's serious business, folks. Boy, I'll tell you what. It says that souls was added to the church daily. Boy, they had a good preacher, didn't they? No, they were all preachers. The whole church was preachers. Folks, you don't understand when God called you, he called you to be a preacher. Maybe not a pastor, but a preacher. You are an earthen vessel with this treasure therein, and you are to proclaim the gospel. Now, when Saul began to persecute the church, it says they were scattered. Boy, I mean they were scattered. The church was scattered. But you know what it says? They were scattered, and everywhere they went, they preached the word. You all heard me talk about Sumner Wimp. He's the best soul winner I have ever, I, I know anything about. I talked to him this week. He said he'd be glad to come to the church and preach. I'd love to have him come preach. I mean, here's a man, it's just an everyday thing. I mean, it's, he don't know any better. He thinks he's supposed to be winning souls. That's silly. He wins people. He says he, he gets very depressed if he doesn't win somebody every day to the Lord. Very depressed. And boy, we look at people like that and go, wow, man, here's a guy that's led thousands of people to the Lord. Whoa. Listen, folks, that's what we all ought to be doing. That's what the early church did. They, everybody was preaching the gospel. Not just the preacher. You know what the preacher's job was to do? Feed the sheep and so that they would grow so that the church would do the work of the ministry. That's my job is to feed you so you go out from here and do the work of the ministry. Boy, I mean, no one that church, listen, that church wasn't growing, it was multiplying. I mean, the gospel was just spreading. Souls was being saved. But you see, also, they had such a burden. Do you know what it says there about Peter? And it says, he forsook all and straightway followed 
And I believe that's what makes a successful soul winner is somebody that's willing to forsake all. Now, keep in mind, he didn't have much. He was just a poor fisherman. He had two boats and some nets. But that's all he had. But he left it to follow Jesus. Are you willing to leave all? Listen, if you could save your family and your friends, the people you work with, the people outside these doors, would you be willing to forsake all? Would you be willing to give up your hobbies? Give up your friends? Give up your wishes and desires? Would you be willing to say, I'm giving it all up? Listen, folks, that was his living. That was his living. He turned his back on it and walked off down the road arm in arm with Jesus. He forsook all. Then we see him on the day of Pentecost and he gets up and preaches a little short sermon and 3,000 people come to Christ. Why? Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men. He didn't say, stay where you are. No. Follow me. Follow me. Are you willing to follow me? Are you willing to give up all? You know what? There's people in this church maybe that aren't saved this morning. Maybe they're looking at you. They might be thinking, when I see something out of you, then maybe I'll believe it. But I don't see any change in your life. See, I want to tell you something, folks. People that are lost, they're in spiritual darkness. They're in spiritual darkness. And if people that are saved aren't excited and burdened, why will they get alarmed? They're not going to get alarmed. They're in spiritual darkness anyway. But if the Christians don't even care, they're not going to care. Our very actions say, we don't care about your soul. We're not going to forsake all and follow Jesus just to save you. <laughs> if you want to get saved, you go up there and get saved, but don't expect me to do anything or give up anything. Boy, I'll tell you something, folks. There's a famine in the land. There's not many being saved nowadays. I don't know if anybody ever looks at the, the Baptist messenger or not, but it always tells in there the additions and stuff in the churches. There'd be one here, two here, maybe three here, four here, one here, two here, none here. But you see, that don't tell you how many's being saved. That just tells you how many came forward. A lot of those people are leaving this church and joining this church, and these are leaving this church and joining this church. People aren't being saved. Why? Why? Because we're not willing to forsake all and follow him. We're just not willing to give it up. And he says, if the love of the world, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. But there's a guarantee, folks. He said, follow me, and I'll make you to become fishers of men. You'll be successful if you'll follow me. But you've got to pay the price. You've got to be willing to leave it all behind. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. One time a man wrote this. He said what it is to be crucified. He said if a man's crucified, he's looking one way. He's not coming back. And he's making no plans for the future. And that what, that's what it means to forsake all and follow him. Just say, Lord, I'm dead to the world and the world's dead unto me. I'm following you. The world has lost its charm. I'm dead to the world. I'm alive unto Christ. Now, Father, at thy word, I'll drop the net. <laughs> Are you willing to drop the net? Are you willing to follow him and drop the net? You see, I want to tell you something, folks. There's no shortage of people out there that need to be saved. There's no shortage.